Hello, everyone. You are very kind. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today in person and online. Um, I'm so happy to share some of my research with you today. I often wonder, is fame or recognition by a handful of textbooks the sole arbiter of a composer's worth? Surely there have been countless brilliant composers lost to time. Their manuscripts may have vanished or been destroyed, their musical achievements forgotten even by their own descendants. However, there are also hidden composers whose work is still available for our rediscovery if we but initiate a careful search. Inspired by the work of Christine Ahmer in her 2001 monograph titled Unsung, A History of Women in American Music, I began to research the work and life of Eleanor Everest Freer several years ago searching for repertoire for my opera and voice students at Towson University. Eleanor Everest Freer not only possessed musical talent and a refined compositional craft, but also the foresight and means to preserve her work for posterity by sending many of her works to the Library of Congress in the last decade of her life. Thanks to colleagues at the Library of Congress, I was able to access some of Freer's scores and three years of sleuthing began. <laughs> My doctoral dissertation here at the University of Maryland aims to shine a light on Freer's magnum opus, a collection of 44 songs called the Sonics, Sonnets from the Portuguese after almost a century of dormancy. Freer, is still the first and only composer to have ever set and published all 44 poems of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's masterwork of English poetics. This lecture will give an overview of Freer's life, work, and legacy, but focuses specifically on her song cycle, the sonnets from the Portuguese. Over the last century, only a few other scholars have discussed, in small part or passing, Freer's sonnets cycle and her art song writing. No professional recordings exist of the work. This lecture will reveal that because of Freer's persistent advocacy for American vocal writing and her own compositional masterwork, Sonnets from the Portuguese, written in 1910, Freer deserves not just to be remembered, but celebrated for her important accomplishments. In order to understand the context for Freer's accomplishments, it's important to review her background as a musical prodigy, savvy advocate, and respected composer. Eleanor grew up in Philadelphia in a musical family. Her father, Cornelius Everest, was a music theory teacher, organist, conductor, linguist, and sought-after vocal pedagogue who encouraged his daughter's extraordinary musical skills. Her mother was a gifted amateur singer, and it is recorded that young Eleanor first began singing, but then quickly focused on playing the piano by age five. The Everest family regularly hosted distinguished singers when they visited Philadelphia, some of which were to play vital roles in Eleanor's endeavors later in life. Renowned soprano Christina Nilsson heard young Eleanor when she was just 19 and was so impressed with her vocal ability and perfect intonation that she connected her with a sponsor. This benefactor gave her the chance to travel to Paris to audition at the prestigious Mathilde Marchese School. As Freer's biographer, Agnes Green Foster, describes it, when the young girl sang for Madame Marchese in May of 1883, she immediately impressed the famed pedagogue. Eleanor studied for three extremely intense years completing her studies in vocal technique, stage deportment, pedagogy, and the languages of Italian, German, and French. 
In addition, she studied music theory with Benjamin Godard and played piano for Madame Marchese's voice classes. Despite the unexpected death of her father in Philadelphia in 1885, Eleanor's mother urged her to finish her work. In 1887, Eleanor returned to the States as the first person certified to teach the esteemed Marchese method of vocal pedagogy across the Atlantic. Multiple newspapers heralded her return and outlined her decision to become a teacher of vocal music so that other young musicians would no longer be required to travel abroad to finish their studies. Eleanor Freer described her years of study thusly. As I look back over these three years, they mean to me only work. <laughs> What I have done in my writing and in my attempts to further the cause of American musical art comes under the same word. Success means work, more work, and still more work. <laughs> the teacher may be the great incentive, but to the student falls the labor. And on the quality of the labor depends the degree of success. Although she was in great demand as a teacher in both Philadelphia and New York City for several years, it was through her travels that Eleanor Everest met her future husband, Dr. Archibald Freer, through a mutual friend. After corresponding for some time, Eleanor and the young doctor were married in 1891, and they were soon on their way to Leipzig, Germany, in order for him to pursue further medical studies in residency there. It was there that her daughter, also named Eleanor, was born. After seven years living across the street from the famed Thomas Schule on Hillerstrasse in Leipzig, the family moved back to the States and into a fashionable Lakeshore Drive home in Chicago in 1899. Freer quickly took her place as the wife of a prominent doctor in the highest social circles of the Windy City. This cursory early biography is offered to highlight two points. Freer was a highly trained musical professional and her new social position was to become very advantageous in her future work. At this point in her life, Freer could have taken a path like many other wealthy socialites in her era, raising her family and occasionally amusing herself with various clubs and fundraisers. Well, she did pursue those things she was also an indefat indefat indefatigable woman whose lifelong motto was festina lente, or make haste slowly. <laughs> I love this. She actually translated that full adage like this, and she does this in her own biography. Make haste slowly and lose not your courage. A score of times ever return to your task. Polish it well and ever repolish, but add and efface that the meaning you grasp. <laughs> it was with this dogged determination that Freer purposefully set out to change the state of American vocal arts through her writing, effective organization, and compositional example. It was not an accident that Freer came to focus her efforts on the promotion of American vocal composers. She had grown up surrounded by vocal music and famous opera singers. She had sung for Delib, Massenet, and Liszt as a student in Paris. She learned a tremendous amount through her studies in Paris, but noted, it is not the foreigner, but the individual who teaches by well-bred learning. When we judge Americans by the standards by which we judge foreigners, then we shall as a nation be making progress toward a national art. Freer believed strongly in the potential of American composers and librettists to create high quality original work. Armed with these convictions, an expert musical mind and a powerful social circle, Freer began to write. She penned numerous articles and letters to the editor of publications, including the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, Music News, and Musical Leader. 
In her 1909 letter to the Washington Post, she pleads, this state of affairs must change, and we must now all work to this end, English being sung in all branches of vocal art in America and England. I mean to encourage a love of our national musical art, which can be best done when our music is sung in the language of our country. In 1921, Eleanor Everest Freer founded the Opera in Our Language Foundation. <laughs> With the support of women in her social circles and Edith Rockefeller McCormick, an heiress who also financially supported Chicago's grand opera scene, letters of support for Freer arrived from across the nation for musical leaders, including composer Amy Beach. A few years later, Freer established a prize for American composers in order to further support the art form. This David Bispham Medal was given to more than 60 composers between 1924 and 1955. This list includes names such as Victor Herbert, Charles Wakefield Cadman, Mary Carr Moore, George Gershwin, and Virgil Thompson. Many composers' works were unknown when they received their awards and went on to great heights. This list includes women and people of color. Ultimately, the Bispham Medal and the Opera in Our Language Foundation combined to create the American Opera Society of Chicago. Impressively, this society is still in existence and continues to award a range of scholarships every year. The full effects of Freer's American uh, organizational uh, actions are immeasurable, but certainly reverberate across the decades. In addition to her letter writing campaigns and her formal work in the above mentioned organizations, Freer expanded the repertory of American vocal music by using her considerable social capital and musical knowledge to personally mentor many young musicians as well. Her private correspondence is full of these instances and includes young composers and conductors, such as Hamilton Forrest, who was one of her longtime copyists. In addition to her work as an advocate and mentor, Freer contributed to the growth and visibility of American vocal music through her own composition. While she was raising her family and raising funds for the cause of the art, Freer wrote 11 chamber operas and published more than 150 songs during her lifetime. In 1901, she began composition studies under the tutelage of renowned German theorist Bernhard Zien. There's his excellent photo right there with his wonderful mustache. Zine happened to reside in her Chicago neighborhood, just a few blocks from her home. Freer was a very pragmatic composer, purposefully writing songs for medium voice and chamber operas for small casts and piano, which were easily performed by singers of varying technical levels. Her operas were often performed in university opera programs as well as in more professional settings. Her first opera, The Legend of the Piper, was performed most frequently and received excellent critical press. She was an early member of the National League of American Pen Women, which is still in existence today. Amy Beach, Gina Branscombe, Eleanor Roosevelt were also members with her. Freer's music was performed, in addition, at the 1934 Chicago World's Fair on a concert with the music of Amy Beach, Florence Price, and Cécile Chaminade, among others. However, Freer's career was focused on her efforts in support of the larger art form, not her own composition. In her autobiography, she allows only the last four pages of her book to describe her own composition. She mentions her operas, but completely leaves out 
her largest vocal work, her 44 song cycle, Sonnets from the Portuguese. Eleanor Everest Freer used her knowledge, tireless organizational skills, and generosity of spirit to advocate for American composers of vocal music. She knew her work would take time and extreme effort. As she laments in her 1924 letter, she wrote to Carl Engel of the Library of Congress, my work has been mostly against the stream. Nevertheless, Freer continued her promotion of American vocal music undaunted for the next 18 years, declaring, I have a husband, a daughter, three grandchildren to live for, my art, which I have always loved, and my country, equally. Since she died in 1942, Freer would not live to see the massive chain of events that she helped set in motion. One winner of the BISFA medal, Virgil Thompson, would go on to become a leader of operatic avant-gardism that would serve as a catalyst for the work of Philip Glass and John Adams. In 1963, Marian Anderson sang her favorite arrangement of He's Got the Whole World in His Hands on the Steps of the Lincoln Memorial that was arranged by Freer's own mentee, Hamilton Forrest. Freer's influence was immeasurable, but now it is mostly forgotten. Until recently, Freer's own compositions have also been lost to time as well. However, because she was quite savvy, she sent many of these works to be documented at the Library of Congress and other smaller libraries all around the country before she died. Now, through an examination of her masterwork, the sonnets from the Portuguese, we have the opportunity for her work to be uncovered once again. Freer was deeply drawn to the work of British poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who lived from 1806 to 1861. Biographer Fiona Sampson describes EBB, as Elizabeth often referred to herself, as Britain's greatest woman poet who changed the course of literary history not only as a pioneering modernizing writer, world famous in her day, but as an influential political campaigner. A prodigious child, she was reading Shakespeare, Homer, and Milton from a young age and wrote her first epic poem at age 11. Without access to any kind of university education for women, Elizabeth was largely self-taught. In 1838, when the family moved to London, she became more engaged with the literary scene there and began correspondence with a poet who she greatly admired, Robert Browning. After many letters, EBB and Robert Browning first met in May of 1845. Despite her family's objections and her own hesitations, Elizabeth and Robert secretly married and eloped to Italy in 1846. However, it wasn't until 1849, years later, that Elizabeth revealed to Robert the 44 Petrarchan sonnets she had penned during their courtship in London. These sonnets from the Portuguese, so titled to imply possible origins of translation and to hide their passionate personal content, were included in Elizabeth's next edition of poems published in 1850. Elizabeth and Robert Browning flourished after their move to Italy, living mostly in Florence and meeting artists and writers from around the world until her poor health finally overcame her and Elizabeth died in Robert's arms in 1861. Eleanor Everest Freer, who often signed her name with her initials as EEF, was undoubtedly drawn to EBB on several levels. Remember, Elizabeth Barrett Browning was not a distant character to Eleanor, and she only died just three years before Freer was born. Like Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Freer was also an independent thinker, a multilingual artist, and a prodigious talent. She likely shared EBB's abolitionist views, having grown up in Philadelphia among Quaker friends, and further evidenced by her inclusion of women and people of color in her professional efforts. 
However, it is most clear that Freer was drawn to the exquisite, complex, and intellectual composition of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's poetry above all. As mentioned earlier, Eleanor Evers Freer is still the only composer to have set and published all 44 of the sonnets. This monumental undertaking took Freer years to complete. This could not have been done without serious interest, commitment, and fascination with the source material. Freer had been recently studying with Bernard Zine in weekly lessons for five years. She completed the first 11 of the sonnets between 1907 and 1909. Although Freer's biographer reports that nonspecific poor health slowed her work, the massive cycle was complete by 1910. Despite the cycle being completed then, the first and only record of it being performed in its entirety took place in 1920, a decade later. The Milwaukee Sun Times, uh, Sunday Times reported on August 4th, 1920, Mrs. Freer is approaching a climax of many months of intensive labor. For on November 15th, there will be given a first rendition in song of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's 44 sonnets in the Portuguese by Mrs. Freer in Orchestra Hall Foyer. The cycle will be heard in four recitals. So it was broken up over four evenings. The magnitude of this task and the brilliancy of its conception and finish have drawn the most unreserved praise from names high in the world of composition. Bernard Zine says, so far as my knowledge reaches, I know of nothing that could with justice be placed beside it. Herman de Vries, speaking with his customary candor, says in part, public recognition of Mrs. Freer's superior talents will not be absent when these sonnets are heard this fall under important and worthy auspices. The conoscenti know her and have pronounced her sonnets the finest expression of feminine love emotion since Schumann's Frauenleben und Leben. Eversall writes that Music News reported on the final evening of the series. Ethel Jones, the singer, not only is a possessor of a beautiful voice and superb musicianship, but of a sincerity. It was a thoroughly rehearsed performance, one of authority. The Freer sonnets are now part of the known American composer repertoire. They are difficult for both singer and pianist, but sensitive and beautiful when performed as they were. On this slide, you can see the singers and pianists listed for all four evenings in the October 1920 edition of Music News. Beulah T. Porter played the piano for the first three evenings, accompanying three different singers, Mrs. John Sidney Burnett, Mrs. C. Furness Hatley, and Mrs. Rudolph Odin, while Ms. Violet Martins Link played for Miss Ethel Jones in the final set. The concerts reported netting large returns for the 10 charities listed on the program. Almost $11,000 in today's 2023. Uh, 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 kind of counting. <laughs> um, Eversall points out that although selected portions of the sonnets were sung by many different singers, both male and female, in succeeding programs throughout Freer's life, no other presentation of the entire cycle was ever given. Freer did utilize six of the sonnets reproduced in their entirety in her last 1936 chamber opera, The Brownings Go to Italy, which tells the story of Elizabeth and Robert's courtship through their poetry. I am directing and producing this opera with my students at Towson University in four performances on May 5th, 6th, and 7th at Towson University for those interested in hearing these pieces in that context. Today, we will be performing five of Freer's sonnets as an introduction to her full cycle, which will be discussed in my written dissertation in much more detail. Freer's compositional style 
in this cycle is distinct from her more popular patriotic songs, choral works, or chamber operas, which were written for a broader audience with a more popular musical idiom. In the sonnets, she employs frequent harmonic shifts, chromatic exploration, and a seeming unending variety of structure and tonal progressions. Freer obviously subscribed to her teacher, Zine's concept of tonal plurisignificance, or the idea that any tone within a set might become the fundamental through the frequent use of enharmonicism and other experimental tactics. Musicologist Elizabeth Hone Hugberg has recently argued that in Freer's work, what is described as harmonic coloring, the use of chordal effects stimulated by textual considerations, surpasses mere text painting to create a non-verbal narrative that enhances the poetry. Indeed, each piece is expertly crafted and thoroughly intentional in its meeting. One might hear hints of Ives, Strauss, or late Foray in her work, but Freer's style is truly unique. Freer's style of art song composition, composition is deeply connected to the text. Throughout the cycle, she never interferes with Browning's poetic structure by repeating or omitting any lines of text. There are some small instances of spelling or word errors, but she often fixed these when she discovered them or reprinted them in other editions. Hugberg asserts that although Freer's overarching mission to establish an English language musical tradition eventually undermined her compositional career, the care with which she set Barrett Browning's poetry may be seen as its ultimate legacy. Her idiosyncratic sonnet process in which harmonic structure interlocks with dramatic unfolding necessarily defies formal categorization and the teasing out of these structures shows deep engagement with the poetry that is a marked contrast from much songwriting of the time for which Aspect, this aspect alone, the sonnets, merit further exploration. Today, we will have the opportunity to examine a few of them further in comparison to other settings by three other composers of the last century. Born in Picton, Ontario in 1881, Gina Branscombe attended the Chicago Musical College as a piano major with an emphasis in composition. She lived in Chicago for 11 years until 1907. European study was essential for her career and Gina departed to Berlin for a year of intensive study of piano with Rudolf Ganz and composition with Engelbert Humperdinck. Gina married in 1910 and moved to New York City where she lived and worked as a conductor, composer, and organizer for many years, performing extensively throughout the city. Gina Branscombe's music was influenced by the late German romantic style, and she helped develop a 20th century American Victorian musical voice with a body of work encompassing 150 art songs, piano and chamber music, as well as choral works, all of which were readily available during her life. A renowned composer and conductor, after uh, she will be remembered uh, after her death for her richly melodic music. Uh, the Gina Branscombe Project seeks to reintroduce her now to the 21st century. Libby Larson, Born in 1950 in Wilmington, Delaware, has created over 500 works, uh, including art song, chamber music, and orchestral works, and over 15 operas. She earned all three of her degrees from the University of Minnesota, where she studied composition with Dominic Argento. She co-founded the Minnesota Composers Forum with composer Stephen Paulus, which is now known as the American Composers Forum. Larson's compositional style is deeply rooted in her response to the texts she selects, and she often plays with her concept of tonality. Larson writes of her approach to composition. 
My music is built around tonal areas that are vaguely modal and reinforced through pedal tones in the bass. My approach is not four-part voice leading functional keyboard harmony. However, I would describe tonality for me as pools of comfort around a fundamental. <laughs> Juliana Hall, born in 1958, is just a few years younger than Larson and also studied with Dominic Argento at the University of Minnesota after completing her master's at Yale. Since completing her studies, she has become an extremely prolific writer specializing in American art songs specifically. Hall has composed works for dozens of notable singers and her work has been performed all over the world in major venues. In discussing her longtime career interests in writing vocal music, Hall shares that, I have rarely gone a day without some sort of text in my mind. Great writers illuminate beauty, truth, and magic present in even the smallest things in our world. And since song is all about text, it is those writers' insights I wish to share in my songs. Her musical style is imaginative and awfully, often tonally adventurous. Her compositional voice is unique and recognizable, often utilizing rhythmic motives and quickly shifting harmonic language. At this point, we will take a short five minute intermission after which we will hear the music of these fascinating women. Thank you.
everyone. I hope you enjoyed your five minute intermission. I wasn't counting. But I'm sure you'd like to hear some singing eventually in this lecture recital. Great to the best. <laughs> all right, friends. As we heard earlier, all of these women are particularly drawn to texts in their prophecies in varying ways. Branscombe and Freer shared time in the city of Chicago and were both members of the Chicago chapter of the League of American Pen Women and very likely knew each other. Larson and Hall studied with the same composition instructor and both occupy similar circles today, a hundred years later than the former pair of composers. Today, we will perform selections of Browning's sonnets from the Portuguese that these composers each shared as inspiration. While I discuss these and additional songs in much greater detail in my full dissertation, today we will be introducing sonnets 1, 6, 21, 43, and 44. We will hear Freer's interpretations of these texts along with other, other settings by Larson, Hall, or Branscombe. First, we will hear Freer and Larson's settings of Sonnet 1, I thought once how Theocritus had sung. Larson included this poem in her six-song cycle titled Sonnets from the Portuguese, commissioned and crafted with soprano Arlene Auger in 1988. Larson writes in her notes to the cycle that Auger wanted to commission a work that in contrast to Schumann's Frauenliebe und Leben would speak to mature love rather than young love. Browning's first poem muses on the Greek poet Theocritus's positive ideal of life and how that sharply contrasts with her own difficult past. Both Freer and Larson focus on the rich textual meaning through surprising tonal shifts, writing pieces in which the voice and piano are inextricably linked. Larson creates an atmospheric sound world using repeated melodic and rhythmic motives that correspond to the rhythm of the spoken word. Freer uses a declamatory, restative-like opening with a harp figure in the piano to conjure the image of ancient pastoral poetry. Their differing treatments of the last line of the sonnet is striking, with Larson ending with a sense of wonder and Freer projecting dazzling amazement. Patty, shall we? <laughs> You've been so patient. <laughs> Thank you. 
set by Larson in a different cycle from mezzo-soprano, which we will ignore, <laughs> piano and cello 
titled Beloved, Thou Hast Brought Me Many Flowers, published in 1994. Go For Me is the last in this group that includes texts by multiple poets. In this piece, the voice and the cello echo and intertwine with each other, which could be interpreted as an illustration of the mature interconnected love between the two characters in the poem. In Freer's setting, we also see very clear themes of connection as alluded to in the poetry. The chord progression in the first measure is quite peculiar and notable. It begins with a strong E major chord, which gradually expands by half step in the bass clef as the middle voice of the right hand inches upward from E to F. In reality, this progression was crafted by Freer in service of the top two voices of the right hand, which spell out, you guessed it, E, E, F and E, B, B, the initials of Freer and Browning. In this way, Freer is literally spelling out her desired connection and kinship with Browning from across time and space as they posthumously combine their creative outputs. Any doubt of Freer's intention of this cipher should be removed when we see that she also ends this piece with a rolled chord that combines these initials and underscores the overlap with E in three octaves. Finally, just in case we need further elucidation, Freer included a reduction of this cipher progression on the title page of the entire cycle <laughs> in some editions, including the women's initials within the image, as seen here. <laughs> Patty, would you mind playing this progression so that we can all bask in its beauty? And now we will hear Go From Me, first the Larson setting and then the Freer.
of the 21st century. We will next hear a setting of Sonnet 21, <laughs> Say Over, in which Browning implores her beloved to repeat that he loves her over and over again, even if it should seem a cuckoo song. Juliana Hall seems to have fixated on this word choice, describing her tempo marking as cuckoo song with quarter note equaling 80. The piano accompaniment is almost unceasing and motoric, like clockwork, perhaps. The vocal line is fragmented into shorter phrases, which gives the setting an overall feeling of unease or even doubt. Meanwhile, Freer's composition also features a kind of continuous rhythmic ostinato in the piano, which builds in breadth as the work progresses, However, the vocal line also churns with unbridled excitement and confident drive, breaking only for a dramatic recitative. The song deftly slides in and out of tonal centers, but ultimately lands contentedly in the warm D flat major tonality with which it began, secure in reciprocated love. Fresh spring in all 
Sonnet is perhaps one of the most famous poems in the English language, and so we will compare three settings of this masterwork. First, we will hear Gina Branscombe's interpretation of How Do I Love Thee. Branscombe published her cycle of six Browning sonnets titled Love in a Life in 1907. Branscombe's sonority is highly romantic, but includes chromaticism that almost makes the work seem jazzy at times. Despite these color choices, the work is highly tonal and remains rooted in F major. Branscombe repeats lines of poetry for rhetorical effect, which obscures the Petrarchan rhyme scheme of ABBA, ABBA, CD, CD, CD. Larson also chooses to repeat sections of text in her setting, which she selects as the sixth and final piece in her sonnets from the Portuguese cycle. This piece includes piano interludes that are lifted directly from opening measures of Larson's I Thought Once, which we just heard, creating a lovely bookend effect for her cycle. Larson writes with specificity and care, creating moments of ingenious yet subtle text painting. It is unknown if Freer had heard Branscombe's setting when she wrote hers about two years later, but Freer's could hardly be more contrasting. The simple quarter, chordal figures create a sense of trust, maturity, and gravitas inherent in the poetry. Oh, 
Final set. We will compare the titular setting of Larson's cycle. Beloved, thou hast brought me many flowers for voice and cello, and Freer's final composition in her mammoth 44 song cycle. Curiously, although Larson was not aware of Freer's work at all, they both begin with a very similar sigh motive with the word beloved set on three eighth notes, with the first two separated by just a semitone. 
Larson then breaks into a jaunty 5-8 passage and continues to play with major and minor intervals to create a sense of anxiety that sometimes tempers the speaker's plea for unity with their love. Freer takes a different tack, wrapping up her cycle by loosely reprising the melody and accompaniment from the first sonnet. This time, she adjusts the mode to reflect the growth of the character throughout the cycle. While the first sonnet ended in E flat major, this iteration resolves to E major, the triumphant key that represents both EBB and EEF, where these two extraordinary women meet once again. Thank you for sharing this evening with me and these wonderful artists. I hope you have enjoyed exploring this work across centuries and continents and creators. Most importantly, I thank you for rediscovering the work of Eleanor Everest Freer with me. Her dedication, talent, and craft will not be forgotten. Indeed, perhaps we shall love her better after death. <laughs> and in that way, we will not just rediscover her, but revive her.
extraordinary women. Um, here are some links to do so. Thank you so much for coming out tonight and um, I hope you'll join us for a, a, a brief reception afterwards around the corner. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Thank you.